Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am the host of Independent Thought. My name is Desmond Price. No matter where you are in the world, I want to thank you for giving me a few minutes of your day to hear my thoughts. As always, we have a great show for you today. Now here are our topics. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Season 3 of independent thought i am your host desmond price thank you for sticking with us through that mid-season break i had to take a couple weeks off to get some things ready for the back half of season three but now we are back with a new episode and you know before we dive into the episode today i want to just talk quickly to everyone out there who has subscribed to the podcast thank you so much for being subscribed And I also want to say that for those of you who are not already, uh, please go ahead and follow me on Instagram at Independent Thought. It is the best place to keep up with my podcast. I post my stories daily. Best place to kind of find out the day-to-day ongoings of this podcast. So with that being said, let's get into the subject today. And the subject is, as the title would, you know, allude to, should we cancel student debt? Now, the facts that I am bringing to you today for this particular episode come from several sources. I was able to dig up information from CNBC, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank, PBS, uh, TD Bank, and Fox News. So I will be using uh, miscellaneous like pieces of information from those different sources as I kind of bring to you my take today on whether or not we should cancel student debt. So first, let's start with some general facts about what's happening here in our country. So currently in America, we owe, or I should say people who have student loans, I guess I'm included in this category. So I also am part of this grouping here, but Americans owe $1.7 trillion in student debt. Now that seems like a number that seems like, oh, it's a really large number, but I can't quite you know, get a grasp on how big that number is. It's massive. It is absolutely massive. In fact, not only is it massive, it's actually double the current amount of all credit card debt. So the average American family who does have student debt you know, has $48,000 in student loans in their household. Now, you know, when we talk about this subject, there is often, you know, like a lot of animosity that comes between people who feel one way or another, like, why hasn't student debt been canceled yet? Why should we even consider considering eliminating student debt. And I promise that I will address both of those concerns here as we move forward through this episode. But the one thing that I want to point out before we go any further is that currently research has been showing that student debt is leaving many Americans to do things that they normally would not do, like putting off buying a house, getting married, having kids, in fact, it is now being said that there is a great number of households in our country that are spending close to 20% of their total income after taxes on student debt. So it is a giant burden on our economy. That money is being paid to the federal governments. It's not actually really going back into circulation. And so a lot of people are kind of just strapped with this monthly bill that they cannot escape. And the fun fact about student loans, which will probably I'll have to tack on to its own episode in the future, is that you cannot uh, declare bankruptcy to get rid of these loans the way that you can declare bankruptcy to get rid of most loans. You can declare bankruptcy to get rid of a mortgage loan, an auto loan, you know, just medical debt, you can declare bankruptcy to get rid of those types of loans and debts, but you cannot declare bankruptcy and get rid of your student loan debt. And that's actually thanks to a bankruptcy bill that was championed by our president, Joe Biden. But we'll have to save that conversation for another day. So let's talk about this. 
first of all, can it even be canceled? Some people in the Congress even debate if it's possible for student debt to be canceled by anyone other than Congress as a whole. And to that end, I will say this. Via the Higher Education Act of 1965, the Secretary of Education can cancel any federal debt that they see fit. Ergo, if the president chooses to, they can direct their Secretary of Education to forgive any debt that is currently being held by the federal government. And why that is you know, good to know is because the federal government currently owns 92% of all federal, of all student debt. So the government is basically a one-stop shop for most people's loans in this country. I know that some people have loans through private banks, but it is a small population in comparison to most people who basically just pay Uncle Sam whenever they are paying their federal, uh, whenever they're paying their student loans. Now, the conversation has honestly been started by those in the progressive side of the Democratic Party. It was Bernie Sanders and other progressive Democrats who have come out in the past and said that they wanted to cancel all student debt. In fact, Bernie Sanders ran on that when he was in the primary about a year ago. Now, fast forwarding currently, the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, as well as Senator Elizabeth Warren and several other um, members of the House on the Democratic side, including uh, Ilhan Omar and Ayanna Presley, have come out and asked for President Biden to cancel $50,000 worth of student debt for all federal borrowers here in America, which would cancel debt for 80% of people with federal loans. 80% of people, their loans would be gone completely if they hit that $50,000 threshold. Now, Joe Biden has been asked this question several times, either directly in town halls or in interviews or through his press secretary. And he said that he has no appetite to forgive $50,000 worth of relief, but he can stomach the idea of $10,000, maybe. Not sure why he hasn't done it, because back in December, he said that student loan forgiveness should happen immediately. So he said it should happen immediately back in December, but he has not done it yet since he's been in office and all he has to do is sign a piece of paper and it would be done. I'll let you all think about that for a second. So kind of transitioning away from whether or not it can be canceled, the short answer is yes, it can be canceled. President Biden can at the drop of a hat decide that he will cancel student debt and anything that the federal government has in its collection it can just drop off and it would be done with. So he has that power. Whenever he chooses to use it, he does not need Congress whatsoever to cancel federal student debt, does not need them. They are not a part of the conversation right now. So the conversation then transitions to, should it be canceled? What are the arguments against it? Because Obviously, there are plenty of arguments for it, but there are arguments against it. And you'd be surprised where the first one comes from. So the first critique that I saw that was being leveled against student loan debt was, or I'm sorry, not student loan debt, but student loan debt forgiveness, is that we shouldn't forgive $50,000 worth of uh, student loans because that would actually benefit you know, rich people. In fact, uh, it was Joe Biden who said that he did not want to forgive loans for everyone because then he'd be forgiving the loans of people who went to places like Stanford and Harvard and Yale and other Ivy League schools. And he just didn't understand why you would want to forgive the loans of people who went to Ivy League schools. And, you know, when you stop and think about it for a second, you're like, huh, well, maybe we shouldn't forgive the loans of people who went to these really prestigious schools. Like, you know, like, obviously, they don't need help. They went to those really prestigious schools, right? Well, I just want to ask you this. 
if these people were so rich, why would they still have student loans? The last time I checked, rich people don't need help to pay off loans. They don't have loans. Their tuition costs were paid for the second that they walked in the door. So the only people who would actually have loans who would have gone to these schools in the first place are people who maybe were, you know, just academically qualified and came from poor communities around the country, but got the chance to go to one of these Ivy League schools. Should they be strapped with over 100K in debt because they just happened to be academically qualified to go to these schools? Is that really their fate? Now, the question that I also heard quite a bit on Fox News being raised, because there was quite a few different uh, personalities that took the time to weigh in on this issue. One of the first you know, questions that I heard being leveled against student loans is, is it fair to those who paid their student debt to have student debt now canceled for all these other people who haven't been paying their student loans? And I want to take a second to address that particular criticism. Because, you know, on one hand, it is, it is something that I can understand the logic behind. I worked my butt off to pay off my student loans. Why shouldn't someone else have to do the same? And so let's, let's break apart that logic for a second. If you were able to go to school and receive your degree and then go out and get your get a job and then pay off your student loans that's fantastic that, that that's the whole idea right you were supposed to go out enter the workforce get a job that pays well pay back your your debt and that, that's fantastic i'm glad that you were able to do that but at the same time let's be fair to the situation here you were able to go out and get the job that pays you well to pay off your debt or someone paid your debt for you in the first place, which is why you never had debt. But let's say, yeah, you, you went out there and you got that job and you worked and you paid off your loans. That's fantastic. But there are a lot of people who went to college, tried to go into the workforce and were unable to get a job in their profession and now have to settle for jobs that they're overqualified for, have to settle for just menial jobs that, you know, like they never actually like, had any training for whatsoever, but they just took what they could get. You know, there are just certain areas in this country where the job market is so desaturated with talent that you just can't do that well as, as far as like getting the job that you're looking for. And I know that the obvious answer to that may be, well, oh, maybe you have to move. Maybe it's time to move somewhere else. That's not always so simple. You can't just pack up and move and go wherever you want to all the time. Life isn't that simple for everyone. What is simple for one person is not simple for someone else. And while I think that it's great that some people were able to go to school and then get that job and pay off their debt, it doesn't mean that people who haven't been able to do that don't deserve relief. It doesn't mean that those people aren't trying. It doesn't mean that they're not trying to pay off their debts. So this idea that, because I, I think the, the implicit nature of questions like that is that when people ask questions like, oh, should I have to, you know, like, is it fair to other people who did pay off their student debt? You're, you're trying to make it sound like as though the people who haven't paid off their debt completely yet aren't trying or they're not working hard enough. And I think that's just a terribly immoral, like implicit thing that you're trying to insinuate. You know, it's, it's a really just a terrible thing that you're really trying to say about all people, because while there probably are some people out there who don't take this as seriously, who probably aren't working as hard as they want or as they could or going after the jobs they probably are, you know, qualified for, most people are. And that's just the facts as far as I'm concerned. Now, the, the second question that I also heard being leveled against it was, should my tax dollars go to somebody who went into debt to get a liberal arts degree. This was a consistent talking point on Fox News where they try to paint the idea that so many people have student loan debt because they went to college for degrees that have no value in our current marketplace. And let's be fair to the situation. That is true for some people. There, it is true that some people went to school for certain liberal arts degrees and those degree and those like professions just don't pay that well. 
while that is true, they are not those, those people for one, those people do deserve relief just because, you know, just because they went to school for something different doesn't mean that they're just, you know, they deserve to be going to going into debt endlessly. And, you know, maybe there should be a conversation about having different rates of tuition, depending on, you know, like what exactly it is that you're going to school for. I think that might be a great system to implement around the country. But secondly, there are plenty of people who went to school for non-liberal arts degrees who are also struggling. So to paint this picture as if everyone who's struggling with debt, again, is this one type of person does not make any sense whatsoever. The fact of the matter is, is if we did forgive student loan debt, it would give the average borrower in America an extra two to $300 a month. And in a time right now where people are struggling trying to come back from coronavirus, as coronavirus has wiped out so many permanent jobs here in America, as we are trying to do our best to stimulate the economy, as you know, Biden and his administration and the Democratic Congress just passed this $1.9 trillion stimulus bill, the point is that we are trying to do our best right now, or it's perceived that way, to kind of boost up the economy. And so I guess you can kind of already tell where my feelings lie about whether or not I think that student loan debt should be canceled. My answer is yes, absolutely. But not just $10,000, not to $50,000, all of it. Just, just cancel all of it. And that may seem a little extreme to some people, but you know, here's the thing. You know, who does it affect? It doesn't just affect the people who have that money, I mean, who have that debt. It also affects just the economy as a whole. Putting that money back into the average consumer's hands will allow those people to spend money in the economy. There is nothing negative that comes from that. You know, like right now, that money is just going back into the federal government. And what does the federal government usually do with our tax money? Well, let's look at history. Let's look at recent history. Just last year, when they passed that first stimulus package, one of the things that was included in it was bailouts for so many industries, including the airline industry, which was given billions of dollars to kind of stay afloat, you know, because they were on the verge of bankruptcy, not, you know, like, uh, just completely because of the pandemic, but also because of stock buybacks, and how they just kind of chose to mismanage their money over the years. And so instead of being a solvent, you know, like companies, these large airlines, they chose to basically just kind of like run their, their companies into the dirt. And then as they were approaching bankruptcy, you know, they kind of just went to the federal government and asked for a bailout. Congress gave it to them with the contingency that they would not lay off any workers and they did so anyway. Delta, American Airlines, these companies just by themselves laid off tens of thousands of employees last year. And again, they're actually going to furlough and lay off even more people this year. And they're just one particular case in a long list of just nonsense. Where we're talking about the banks being bailed out, you know, like 10 years ago talking about car dealerships being bailed out. We're talking about billionaires getting tax breaks, whether we're talking about subsidies for large you know, agricultural uh, companies, money for endless wars, or we're talking about the IRS, you know, allowing wealthy people to avoid taxes, whether it's companies offshoring jobs so that you know, like, while they get tax incentives or companies automating jobs away while getting tax incentives, the business as usual in our country is to go out of our way to make sure that rich people have all of the tax breaks and all of the bailouts whenever they need it because they don't, you know, Congress doesn't even give us a reason. They just say that it has to be done. It has to be done. But whenever anyone in the middle class or the lower class of this country ask for even the most basic of relief. It has to be means tested. It has to be debated for years. It has to be negotiated down and down and down. And if you even get it at all, and usually it gets just wrapped up in Congress where they just can't agree on things. So 
let us just stop for a second and just understand something really simply. Canceling student debt would help the average person. And we are currently living in a country where our government goes way out of its way to just apparently step on the average person and do nothing but go out of their way to give all of the tax breaks to the people who need it the least. So yes, my final answer is we should cancel student debt. It is about damn time that our government actually tried to do something for the average person instead of for the people who literally need the money the least. And with that being said, we're going to take a quick break and I'll be right back with my guest for this week. Hey, Indie Thought listeners. Has this past year helped you rediscover your creative and crafty side? Well, then you're going to love our sponsor for today's episode. Bathing Beauties Beads is a full service bead shop in the heart of downtown Missoula. Whether it's seed beads, semi-precious stones, vintage beads, or just materials to make a project, they have something for every person and every price range. Not from Missoula? Don't worry. They have an extensive online store and they will ship directly to you. Whether you're a beginner or a pro, they'll welcome you and help you make your next project a reality. You can find them online at Bathing Beauties Beads on Instagram and Facebook or at bathingbeautiesbeads.com. And don't forget to use offer code INDEPENDENTTHOUGHT at checkout to save 15% on your order. Hello, everyone. Welcome back from the break. This is Independent Thought. Today, my guest is Leah from the Take Up Space podcast. Leah, thanks for coming on the podcast today. How are you doing? Hey, thanks for having me. I'm well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Whenever I have a fellow podcaster on to, I guess, the show for the first time, (laughs) I always ask them, you know, what part of the country are you from? And then obviously tell me about your podcast. So really quickly, just uh, tell us about your podcast and where you're at in the country. So I am currently on the East Coast of the United States of America. And uh, like I, like you stated, my name is Leah and I am a part of actually two podcasts. The first being uh, Take Up Space podcast, which is I host with my sister, Kayla. And we talk about the importance of not shrinking yourself or dimming your light to make someone else shine brighter, to make someone else seem bigger. It's just about taking up space, owning your self-awareness, and just rocking it out of who you are. The second podcast that I'm a part of now is Black Core Humor that I host with Baylor the Great and Mr. D713, where we watch horror, f- horror films and give our opinions and reviews. You know what? I need more of that right now. <laughs> Just, the, just the, the simple stuff. I, uh, I, I need more just like, like movie type podcast. If, if I could have like a political podcast, a sports podcast, and like a movie review podcast, I'd, I'd be good to go. That's also a lot of podcasting. It is, but it's so, but what I like about Black Horror Humor is that we are watching horror films anyway. And right. so we just get to do it together and then we spend. It's so it's so much time to edit because we can spend three hours just talking about like the implications of the world that was created by the director, producer, and the writer of the film. Talk about the actors, the setting. Like there's so much, so much to talk about and breaking it down um, or how we would survive in that world. But it's so much fun, like just being able to spend, we block off maybe three to five hours to just like talk about film. Right. I mean... What was it that made you like originally get involved in podcasting? Like what was like, this is the moment that you thought to yourself, like, yeah, I should probably start doing this. Um, so back in 20, I'll say, I'll say 2016, 2017, I was considering starting a business. And then at the beginning of 2020 in February, January, February, I said, okay, might as well just, just start the business and we'll see what happens. But in starting the business, I was learning what my voice sounds like because I had been in corporate for so many years and I had been taught to speak standard English. So I don't really have a more relaxed way of speaking that would be more closely related to the African-American vernacular English. So 
it was that balance back and forth between finding my voice and learning how to help people get to that point as well. And a friend of mine, he, he's been on the show multiple times, uh, Jason was just like, why don't you document this? And I was like, what's the best way to do that? Cause I don't want to write. <laughs> 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 Let's start a podcast. And uh, it was on a whim on a random Tuesday in, in July. I just picked a date. This was like the second week of June picked a date in July. was like, all right, we're launching, launching what I have no idea, but we're going to record some stuff and see what happens. Okay. So, yeah, it was, it was, definitely on a whim but it's been it's honestly been great it's probably been one of the highlights of um it's been one of the highlights of 2020 definitely for me yeah and for those who haven't already uh please go check out her podcast i'll have the uh link to it uh in the episode notes below you know one of the conversations that we were actually just talking about before the episode started was just i guess just issues surrounding black people in america Yep. And, you know, I remember we were talking about this, you know, before in previous conversations that we had, because I also, you know, came on to your podcast, which, again, for those who haven't already, go check out her podcast, listen to the episode that I came on and other episodes too. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> plug yours specifically. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, you, you have to do these things. But, you know, one of the conversations that, you know, we were having, uh, was, I guess, like on your podcast, you had a, a guest come on and talk about how, um, how it was exhausting feeling, you know, being black in America and kind of tying right. back into that subject that you were just talking about here about like having to learn how to talk differently, uh, to be in corporate America. Uh, is that something that you struggle with? I mean, as far as trying to be a different person when you're in the corporate world or does it feel natural to you? Like what are the challenges or not challenges there? So I actually, it wasn't until I had a conversation recently with a different podcaster that I realized that my story may be switched. So when we think of things like code switching, which is changing up, the, your tone, the way you talk, um, things like that, the way you present yourself. Um, typically, it has to refer, it refers to Black people learning how to speak in their interview or corporate voice when they are at work versus how they are when they get off of work. Um, for me, it's backwards. So I... <laughs> I learned how to speak standard English. Like, I learned how to speak corporate talk growing up. Yeah. So I had to learn how to speak in slang. I had to learn how to speak in the African-American vernacular English. Like I had to learn how to relax my words and how to not sound so formal when speaking to other people. And because it made them uncomfortable because they felt that I was using my corporate voice, which is natural to me when I'm talking to them in a more, um, relaxed social setting. Like you can't, you shouldn't sound like you're in the office when you're at a kickback, but that's what happens. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was, it's more natural for me to talk like I'm in the corporate world as opposed to it being, um, as opposed to the way I would talk hanging out at a cookout or um, at a friend's house. Yeah. You know, there's, and I'm, I'm just going to ask this. Did you ever get accused of uh, sounding too white? Yes. How yes. does that make you feel? Because I have my own thoughts on how that's made me feel when I've had that be said to me in the past. But tell me how you feel about that. Um, I really thought when people, when people said things like, oh, you sound white or, you know, why do you talk like that? or anything like that. Like my voice was my voice. And there's, it, it was just like, if somebody were to tell me that I'm too light or too dark, what am I supposed to do with that information? Like, how does that affect you in your daily life? It didn't, it didn't really offend me. I just thought I felt bad for the person, honestly, because I was just like, their ignorance knows no bounds. <laughs> like you, like there's, there's how, how can you, tell someone that their voice is something that is clearly not like me sounding there's no sounding white you either speak standard english 
or you speak another form of English when you are communicating with English speakers? Yeah, you know, for me, it was, it was kind of like difficult for me when I was like, when I was really young, because when I was living in uh, Pennsylvania, I was living like right outside of Philly. And the school that I was at was, I think, like, right around like 30% black. Mm-hmm. And so it was, it was predominantly like white school, but there was a lot more black people there than there is where I'm currently at. Um, but I remember like being like in that age where I was like, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, like I just tried hanging out with anybody. But when I would hang out with, you know, certain like black kids growing up, I was always being told that I, I talked too white. And I remember that being like a thing that, you know, not every black person, but like a lot of black people would say to me, like, as I would get older, and I just never understood what the stigma really was. I mean, like, I didn't understand why it mattered so much how I talked or why it bothered so many people or why they felt the need to point that out to me all the time. Yeah, I think that with that, it bleeds over into being smart isn't cool. You know what I mean? And I can more identify with sounding more intelligent than the people you're around it is not it for me is not it's not intentional this is just how I know to communicate my thoughts and if I'm communicating my thoughts in a way that makes you feel uncomfortable because you feel that I'm attacking your intellect that's then that's a you problem not a me problem now you can tell me hey I would appreciate you not using the Oxford Dictionary, which I don't talk like that, but right. um, but I would appreciate you, you know, can you, can you break that down? Like, can you make that make sense? Like, I have people around me who, even now, if I talk and they say, well, I don't understand what you're, what you're trying to convey, then I'll say it again in a different way so they can understand it. But for people to belittle others for, oh, you talk white or, or, um oh you're you're just a nerd you sound like you you're not you're not cool because you're trying to be smart and all this kind of stuff i think that people especially unfortunately in, in um in our demographic have made it so that it's not cool to be smart so in that instance i wouldn't raise my hand to answer a question i wouldn't um I wouldn't want to speak out in class. I wouldn't, I would dumb down my papers so that I wasn't always like top in class. And it wasn't until probably college that I stopped doing that because no matter what I did, like I couldn't help but sound like me. I could not help but be me. Yeah. And that's, that's something that like no one should ever have to face, you know, regardless of any circumstance, you should never have to feel uncomfortable with who you are but it it is a real stigma that I feel like is in the community and you know I don't I mean when I was younger I just wanted to be accepted so there was was a part of me that was like oh well maybe I should change how I talk more because I'm not talking the right way but as I've gotten older I've kind of fallen into the same way of thinking that you have where I realize that it's more about them and about their insecurities yes yes yeah and I just As I've gotten older, thankfully, I've gotten into a better place where, you know, just even outside of this conversation in particular, you know, when I encounter somebody who is obviously like unleashing their insecurities on me, I've done a better job of recognizing that and being like, I don't need to change my behavior because you're insecure right now. That's that's you. That's on you. Yeah. And I and in in that same vein, I try to understand where that security comes from or that insecurity comes from it's like okay you're attacking me for being naturally who i am and this part about me makes you uncomfortable it's not an attack on your character but it makes you uncomfortable so i try if i care enough about the person right to have a have a conversation surrounding that because what i am learning is I am a lot of work and I am not (laughs) going to take time to change something about myself that is naturally occurring. Yes. If I naturally speak this way, if I naturally do this thing, if I naturally, whatever it is, if I naturally do that thing and it bothers you, 
to where you feel like you have to dumb me down or cast a shadow or or dim my light just so that you you want me to bring you want to bring me down to your level I can't have you in my circle I can't have you in my presence because it doesn't bode well for the rest of the relationship you know what I mean Speaking of which, you were telling me recently that you were having um, some issues with dating people. Um, oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> is, is any of what we were just talking about related in that? Have you been meeting some some people recently who have been kind of like making you feel like you had to change parts about yourself or or, or just tell me about the about the issues that you've been having right now? Yeah, so... Uh, so I'll say probably in the last in the last like few years and I and I in like in that late late 20s early 30s range is when that self-awareness really should be kicking in yeah. where you not just know who you are but you understand where you are or you begin to understand what your triggers are what your wants are and where you're look i've tried things in my 20s and i know these things are not going to work so this is this is what i want um but recently in the last two maybe three years um it's been rather hard to date um be and and let's and i just want to put it out there for your listeners because some people haven't heard this and they really need to hear this i am ready hold on okay <laughs> yep ready to hear it when you date you have an idea of the mate that you want the partner that you want right but you have to take it a step further does that person want someone like you or want you specifically a lot of times we get stuck with well i want this person okay, do you have what it takes to get that person? What are you offering to that person? And then does that person actually want you or are they looking at someone else? So then, so after you reconcile that, well, let me see who I really want as someone who would actually want me in return to reciprocate those feelings. You got to figure out, okay, what is it that you bring to the table to that person to have like a successful relationship? And uh great i'm sorry go ahead i'm sorry go ahead oh uh, no i was just to say that that's that's a great thing to point out i mean you know i was speaking with somebody you know um a couple of years ago you know just i guess for full disclosure i uh, i had to go into therapy for a couple for a little while a couple of years ago and i remember while i was um while i was going through that i was you know the conversation kind of brought up about like how i was wanting something different from you know kind of like a family member and i was talking mm. about my relationship with that person mm -hmm. and i was just asked a really simple question you know which was like what do you bring to the relationship yeah kind of like putting it back on me and it may, you know asking me to think about like what was i bringing to the relationship versus me focusing on how my relationship with them wasn't good enough it was like well are you also bringing something to this relationship and it was just something that I didn't realize that I'd never really stopped to think about it before. I was just like, <laughs> okay, what am I bringing to this relationship? Am I making right. sure that that person's needs are met? And that's just, that's not even just like, you know, like with your partner, but just like, again, and in, in family and in friendships, you know, it's just like, am I, you know, like holding up my end of this relationship here? Yeah. The, listen, it's so hard. It's so hard to like look in the mirror and say, okay, I see I need to bring this, 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 and this, but you can always look at someone else and say, you have to do this. You need to do that because I'm a person, even though I, I take care of myself and all that kind of stuff, I will not say that I am the quintessential independent woman. I do not need to be a strong black woman. I, I am proud to say that I want a man to come and, and have compliment, like be my compliment in life. That's what I want. I don't want to be by myself forever because that sucks. But what I will yeah. say is I, just like you were saying, I would say, oh man, like I want to be secured. I want to be protected. And it's like, okay, you want to be secured. Yes. You want your partner to have to protect you. Yes. Well, 
you have to be vulnerable. I have to what? I have to, I'm sorry, what? No, you, if you want to be protected, you have to be vulnerable. And I am like one of the most guarded people. So how can I expect protection from someone or how can I expect someone to be there when I show them that I don't need them? It's a fair point. I mean, it's so, a really fair point. Yeah. You, I mean, so it's, it's not just, you know, well, I want this person, but are you able to compliment them? So in my dating life, um, it has one of the biggest things, um, and it's, and you know, 2021 people can say the date and the year all they want, but change is incremental, especially societal change. Yeah. So we can say, Oh man, the problems that my grandparents have, we don't have anymore. Well, we now have microwaves and ovens and convection ovens and able to go through drive through So maybe not some of those problems, but relationally speaking, we still deal with a lot of the same issues. So one of the things that I thought that I had to change was when I started dating, my first boyfriend was white. And I did not realize how much people disliked interracial relationships until I was like, yeah, I did a white guy. What? It was a huge thing. Not just like, and I'm going to say like my family never gave me any hate or anything like that. They were just like, oh, oh thank God she can finally like go out and socialize with people. <laughs> but it's like, cause yeah. I, I never, I had never really, I didn't start dating until college. And so I thought, you know, I didn't really have, I didn't really care for it. Um, just because in high school, everybody had everybody. I didn't really want to be with them. But um, recently, it has been more of a thing where we have, especially with the people who are just, oh, the kings and the queens and the hoteps and the this and the that, um, you know, how could you, and I'll, and I'll say, like, no problem, like, yeah, like, I'm. it's not that I'm, like, attracted to white guys solely, but they're the only ones who would approach me. I'm not chasing down. Why would I go and chase down a man if I have like five of them who are approaching me? Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. There is something that I, I want you to explain to the listeners really quick before we move on. Can okay. you explain to the listeners what a HOTEP is? Um, in layman's terms, because I, because I'm not fully aware of, of all of who they are because I kind of put them in the same group as like the the black Israelites and the people who are just like the curse is going to be lifted and black people are going to be the top of everything and we need to go back to our roots of kings and queens and white people are the devil and they're the I kind of put them all in the same group of like them black supremacist yes that's and I'm just like and I'm not saying that I'm not saying that any I don't believe that any race is better than any other race or any ethnic background. If you say human race is the only race, whatever, there's no ethnic group that is above another. I think we're all people as a collective who, if we work together, have a lot more to offer to humanity than just your skin's more tan than mine naturally. Yeah, I had only just in the last few years learned about what a hotep is, I uh, or who they are rather. I I never had any run-ins with people like that growing up. Uh, so when I was first like explained to, like what that was, I was like, wait, what? Like, wait, what? What exactly is? Okay. okay. Yeah, I don't really understand. Like, okay, so what I I think my frustration with. And this is and this is why I don't really I don't really buy into what any of them have to say because all of my conversations have ended rather poorly with them because I just and for those who don't know me, I just want to get an understanding. If I'm asking a question, it's genuinely be, it's genuinely because I want to know. So I'm not trying to pin you into a corner. I'm not trying to paint you into a box. I'm not trying to make you look bad. I genuinely just want to know. So even when, um, so when I ask a guy who, and, I, and he could have been new, 
could have been new, um, but I'm asking him what his beliefs are and all his beliefs sound exactly like what white supremacists would say about black people. Yeah. He was saying about all, everyone else or um, when I was asking like what his purpose is as far as what he what his goals are as, as far as like family and community and things like that. And I'm just like, okay, I can't get with this. Like, I don't, I don't understand why do we have to hate or uh, because I personally, if I hate something, I, I can't function really. That's why I don't really harbor ill feelings or like hold grudges because that's too much energy going in the wrong direction. Yes. So when they preach that, you know, we must hate uh, people who are not black when if we say that life started in Africa, are we only talking about people with dark skin? Because there's light skinned black people. Like, what are we, what are we, how do we differentiate? And then everybody in the U.S. is so mixed anyway. So where are we drawing the line here? Yeah, no, it, it seems, it seems really cultish and, um, nothing that i want anything to do with i'm glad that i haven't met any of these people in real life because oh they're everywhere like they're i mean especially well you say you only spend like five minutes on twitter at the time but <laughs> is, i'm true. telling you some of these true. people are um and it, i mean on the surface it sounds cool you know we need to return to you know our roots of being this uh, this is what i don't understand Okay, we're going to get back to the topic, but this is what I don't understand about these black supremacists. You talk about being like, because they say all these things and you can always connect it back, connect it back to being a black supremacist. So they are black supremacists without saying that they're black supremacists, right? Right. But they never, and not the ones that I've talked to, I've talked to four. And the ones that I have talked to are, um, not i have not expressed to me um any interest in connecting with the african continent any country like just pick a country in africa i don't care if you are in um uh, where is it like in senegal nigeria you go to ghana connect with any country in africa or just say oh you know back to the like nothing None of them can, they just start like, and so I'm just like, if you want to go back to like the Kush empire, like if you want to go back to where we were actually on top, then wouldn't you reconnect back with those roots? But that's just me asking a question because I genuinely want to know. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't even understand you know, the concept of anyone thinking that their race is supreme over, over another race. So it's just like, I don't, for me, I don't get it. Yeah, it's like, you know, like, honestly, if you, you can't really paint that picture for me in a way that's positive. If I was talking to somebody who was a black supremacist, someone who's a white supremacist, someone who is a supremacist of another ethnic group, you know, whatever the case may be, if you're trying to tell me that your, your quote unquote race is supreme over some over everyone else, I got no time for you. I got no time yeah, for you. I don't have time for that. It's not based in anything. Like, no. yes, there are, we can, there are some terrible, terrible things that have been done to um, our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents, going back, going back to when this country was founded, right? We could say that as, as being from here, right? But, <sighs> that doesn't mean that we have to repay violence for violence. Now, I do believe in protecting yourself. If there was present violence that was being, that's being conducted against you. Yes, I would, I'm not saying turn the other cheek, but what I am saying is that I cannot take a whole group of people in today who have not, who have distanced themselves from like, if they, I mean, of course, if they're like, of the daughters of the confederacy or they're waving the rebel flag with the intent of causing harm to my person or talking negatively against my person i'm not going to support their business or anything that they have to say but i'm not going to actively hunt them down or actively um 
tear tear down whatever they are building unless it is negatively against my community there's way too many other things for me to focus on but to just have hatred toward anyone who is white or who is mixed or who is cuz that per that mixed person has no say over who they are um or you know whatever but individually i can absolutely say that there are people who i just don't trust or i don't or that i don't care for but to say that oh this entire ethnic background group is just no we're not dealing with them yeah you know racism is something that i will never truly understand especially having dealt with it you know so much in my own life i mean especially when i was younger living in pennsylvania i remember it's, it's a, a daily thing just you know just every single day having to deal with that i just don't understand that from any particular side and i also yeah. don't understand people who try to defend you know anything that is you know in connection to it like the people who still defend the confederate flag i i, I can't even wrap my head around it i mean you have lived in this you lived in the <laughs> south before i remember you, you told me you lived uh, in north carolina at one point yeah <laughs> Have you ever run into people like, you know, just like personally who try to defend the Confederate flag to you, try to like tell you reasons why it's it's not a symbol of racism or hate or what have you? Have you run into that conversation? Um, more in Texas than anything else. Oh, um, tell me. And when and it wasn't until I because I, I had to watch uh, a documentary on it because they couldn't really tell me why and I understand why they can't tell me why it's the same thing as people who are um and before I say this I want everybody to know that I'm Christian I accept the Lord Jesus Christ as my savior and I just want y'all to know these baby Christians are ruining it for some of y'all okay People who are Christian as an adult, but they still rely on the, they rely on their parents' relationship with Christ to say that they are a Christian. Um, that is the way that these people who um, fly the Confederate flag or um, or defend its its standing, um, that's the way they talk about it. There is a deep emotional connection to it because it's been taught since childhood and they have been surrounded in their community by it so it must be right in their mind you know what i mean it's not a thing of i intentionally personally hate this group because of what they've done it's just that my parents taught me xyz and this flag represents all of my heritage so yeah that's what that's the way that i understand them to be it doesn't make it right i don't agree with it but that's how i understand them you know it's it's a conversation that i've, I've talked about a few times on my podcast now because i don't understand how logically you could sit here and say to yourself like yeah, you know, Confederate flags aren't a bad thing. Yeah, Confederate monuments aren't a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to have schools and public libraries and military bases named after Confederate generals. Like, the fact that there's so many people who are just on board with this, it just, it just blows my mind. And I think it just, it comes down to the fact that so many people in the, in the like, the Sun Belt of this country have been conditioned their entire lives to believe that it was... Uh, a connection to their heritage yes. but not really being told what the heritage was founded right, in. right you know it's just right. like i and then, but on a broad sense everyone knows what the confederacy was fighting for but they for some reason have some kind of disconnect in their head about the confederacy and what it stood for and the actual flag and the monuments themselves and it's just like i i, I personally don't get it but a part of me wonders is it the fact that for your entire life, you were told that something was good or okay, and that at some point someone told you no, that it's bad, that people are just incapable of making that switch in their brain. And, and I wonder that because I feel like I see a lot of the same things happening, you know, like with, you know, just kind of like the LGBTQ community and with, you know, just like the feminism movement. It just feels like 
people are now like finally saying like, hey, all these things that you've been used to your entire lives, they've always been wrong. And we need to change this behavior. And people are having like this, like this backlash to that. They're like, actually, no, it's been okay for our entire lives. So we don't feel the need to change our behavior. So get out of my face with that. That's exactly what it is, though. That's exactly what it is. The conditioning that they receive as kids to have that um, emotional attachment to that history, right, is because some people and and granted, you've I mean, with you being where you are in life, especially how we talked about um, where you are and the people who are in your vicinity, just like waking up and realizing how bad it is for people who are not the straight white male in America, um, specifically black people for, you know, oh, golly. Okay. So it's when, they're, right. when they're waking, when they're waking up to realize how bad it is. Right. And they're like, Oh my gosh, has it always been this way? A lot of people can't handle yeah, you actually do have privileges that I will never have, that I will, that I could never think about, and it can't, be in, and for them to realize that for their 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years of living, that they've had it, so they've had more resources or opportunity, they can't then go back and make a switch in their brain saying that knowing that all of what they've experienced is completely different to somebody else they're like oh that's bad let me go back to my to the normalcy that i know let me go back to my safe place there's not many people who can make that switch no lie i kid you not i kid you not i cannot make this up i was talking to a woman who's in her fi late 50s early 60s i said and this is why I don't talk to a lot of people uh, that that can't that are not open minded. I told her, I explained to her that that racism is still in existence. She didn't she didn't want to believe that. She, there's no way. There's I was like, but here's and I didn't know that that she was just not aware. I didn't know there were people who are unaware. I said, do you know about systemic and systematic racism that occurs? that prevents me from, as a black woman, being as successful as you are as a white woman. Exactly, dead silence. She was just like, what are you talking about? I said, okay, all right. Let's take it back to the eighties. Let's Ooh. say, cause you were, I said, you were buying your house, right? And she was like, yeah, you know, um, I was, I was, uh, no, 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 she wasn't buying a house. She was, she was getting married on the way to buy a house. I said, okay, let's say, let's say you were, let's say you were buying a car. And um, and they recognized this in the 80s, and they've recognized this in the 2000s, but I'm not going to take you all the way back because I want you to understand the connection to today. Your parents bought a house in the 80s. Yes, you bought a car um, sometime after that. Yes. Now, when Black people, let's just start with a car because it's something basic, something simple. Black people wanted to buy a car. Their applications are different than your applications. What do you mean? We all fill out the same application. Okay, all right, let's slow down. Let's slow down for a second, okay? You fill out an application. You put white, right? Yes. I fill out an application. I put black, right? Yes. Okay. Because I am black, automatically, I have to have a higher score than you to get a rate just higher than yours. Because I am black, if I have the same score as you, you will all automatically get a better deal. <gasps> what? No. I said, if you were a poor white woman, you would get, or a poor white man, whatever, you would get a better deal going to buy a home or a car just because of where you live, because you have access, because of your zip code, where you live, and because you're white because of, even if your credit score was lower than mine, you could have a 600. Oh, you can't get it. I said, I'm telling you, you can get it with 600. But if I have a 720, my, my, my rate will be higher than yours. And I would only be able to buy in certain areas. Her mind exploded in my face. 
And I was just like, I need you to understand that things are set up differently for me and you. So you telling me in my 30s that I need to go and buy a house, I need you to understand that things are a little bit different because because of situations like that, and that's just cars. Think about homes. Yeah. If we don't have access to homes, do you, I was like, I said, so you, and, and you've never heard of, because you're a white woman, you would never hear about redlining. Right. And you know what, before, before we get into all of that, I, I think this might be the place where we have to uh, cut off the episode and say that we'll have to continue this episode the next time I have you on. Yeah. It's, because... I'm telling you, it's, it just, it, and all of this, the crazy thing is, stems from just me trying to date this is why i can't be great y'all and we're going to continue this conversation so <laughs> the the, ne- the next time that you know leah comes on to the podcast we will be having this conversation continued so be sure to check that out if you have not already definitely subscribe leah before we you know end this episode please tell everybody really quick where they can find your podcast um, definitely. It is Take Up Space Podcast. You can find us at Take Up Space Pod. That's Take Up Space P-O-D on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All right. If you haven't already, again, go subscribe. To everyone else who is listening, thank you so much. I'll be right back from the break. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back from the break, everyone. Thank you for sticking with us on this episode of Independent Thought. I want to first give a special shout out to my guest for this week, Leah from the Take Up Space podcast. Leah is, you know, a good friend of the show. And not only would I normally say I hope to have you back on soon, but Leah and I ended up continuing our conversation from this segment Uh, And it carried over again to a future episode. And I will actually have that episode next week. So Leah's conversation with me will continue on to the next episode. So if you were wondering how we exactly we finished that conversation, just make sure you're tuned in. She will be my guest again next week. So thank you, Leah. And we will be seeing you again very shortly. To my subscribers out there thank you so much for being subscribed for checking out those bonus episodes that came out over the break i saw that quite a few people listened to those so thank you so much uh for those who haven't already uh please go back and check out those bonus episodes and the first 11 episodes of season three i also want to give a special shout out to my patrons I have 15 people who are members of my Patreon right now. Thank you to all 15 of you. If you are listening to this episode and you are interested in joining my Patreon, the link is in the episode notes below. Now, what to watch out for coming up from Independent Thought? Besides my episode coming next week, I will also have another bonus episode coming this week talking about topics that I had previously mentioned on Instagram. So if you are someone who's interested in pitching a bonus episode idea, definitely follow me on Instagram at independent thought. That's the best place to keep up with this podcast and to send me a DM if you have any questions or comments about any episode that you've heard. So follow me on Instagram at independent thought. And the next things that you can really expect from independent thought in the coming weeks are I will be having two episodes back to back that are strictly dedicated to local politics here in Missoula, Montana. I know that there's a lot of you out there who do not reside in Montana or in Missoula. I know that I have a nationally based audience, but I am a resident of Missoula, Montana. So I will have two episodes the first two week of April that'll be strictly for local politics here in Missoula. I will be having on Daniel Carlino, who is running for city council in Ward 3 of Missoula. And I will also have Jacob Elder, who is running to challenge our current mayor. So he is running to be the mayor of Missoula. And both of those episodes will be coming out very shortly, the first two weeks of April. Make sure you're subscribed so that you do not miss either of those episodes. And just to kind of close out this episode, I want to just say that, you know, 
when we're talking about the topics that we went over in my guest segment with Leah, or whether we're talking about student debt that we talked about in my opening segment, you know, the quote that I want to leave everyone with for this week is simply this. The difference between what we do and what we are capable of doing would suffice to solve most of the world's problems. And so with that being said, everyone, let's all just try to work a little bit harder with what's going on in our world around us. And I'm sure that a lot of these things that seem a little insurmountable, you know, really can be solved, really, you know, these issues really can be attained if we all to put in a little bit more of an effort than we currently are. So with that being said, thank you to everyone who listened to this episode. See you next time.